Hey, my Lobos, we are on chapter 39 of Chains. Um, we found out in chapter 38 that Madam has found out that Isabel has been going to the prison to feed the troops. And she told her that um, she is no longer um, to go to the prison anymore. And that once um, Lady Seymour and her husband leaves, because her husband's going back to London to take care of some business. Um, once they leave, her threat was, you know, pretty much I'm getting you. As soon as everybody leaves, yeah, it's me and you. Um, so, um, Isabel is decidedly um, nervous and anxious and a little depressed. She wants to save her friend. Um, it's around Christmas time and Isabel still finds it in her heart to, through everything that's happened with her, to bake bread pudding like her mom used to on Christmas and go um, give it to a less fortunate family. Um, and I, I believe the family was a white family, so that, that's neither here nor there to Isabel. They were in need and she had it in her to do that for them. So it tells a lot about Isabel's character. Um, so here we are at chapter 39. Two days later, Sarah had me go with her to the fish market. Her back was hurting her fierce and I was to carry the cod halibut and halibut needed for a fish chowder. The market was crowded with folk who whose cupboards had been cleaned out by the Christmas feasting, and Sarah muttered, muttered rude things. Her growing discomfort had put her at a constant temper. A, the cod was easy enough to purchase, but stall after stall turned up no halibut. Sarah insisted that haddock or catfish would not do, so we marched on. The air was thick with the cries of stall owners promising the juiciest fish, the freshest fish the and fish fit for the king himself. Before dawn, I had made the trip to the tea water pump, but I had not dared visit the prison or Captain Morse's tavern. I was still confuddled about what to do. My thoughts wandered. I did not realize that Sarah had moved ahead of me in the crowd until a great shout went up. The oyster seller's cart had overturned in front of a carp stall, and two men were hollering at each other. The crowd halted, and I had no place to turn. Sarah's white cap bobbed away in the distance as I looked for a path out of the crowd, but bodies pushed in from all sides to watch the two men arguing. When a, ha when a hand grabbed my arm, I gasped. Apologies, just Sal, Captain Moore said as he released me. His eyes were tired, but his cheeks were flushed. My mouth gaped open like that of a fish breathing its last. I shook my head. He couldn't talk to me in view of all. There was no mistaking what he was, dressed in brown and white coat. I turned first one way and then the other, but bodies were packed around me tight as could be. Morris kept his eyes on the arguing men, but leaned his face close enough to mine that I could hear him whisper, We must talk. Sarah had realized I was no longer with her. Her cap stopped and slowly turned back toward us. Her husband was a British gunner. If she saw me talking to a rebel officer, go away, I muttered. I have news for my men. The oyster seller picked up carp, shook it in the other man's face. The crowd laughed. Sarah plowed toward me. I beg you, Morse whispered, please. Soldiers appeared on the edge of the crowd to restore order. Come up to the tavern. Yes, yes, I told the captain. I'll come this afternoon. Now go away. The crowd melted under the eyes of the armed soldiers. The carp seller was explaining the ruckus to the sergeant while the oyster seller re seller reloaded his carp. Sarah kicked oysters out of her way as she approached. Where in the name of all that is holy did you get to? She asked. I was trapped in the crowd, I said. I called, but you could not hear. She grunted and handed me a small fish with glassy eyes. This will have to do. Halibut is rare as hen's teeth today. I settled it in the basket atop a fat cod and followed Sarah as she headed away from the market. We walked in silence for a few blocks, her concentrating on her huffing and puffing, me trying to figure out if I dared go up to the tavern. The sky promised more snow. How long would Dib Dibden wait before reclaiming Curzon's hat and blanket? We crossed the street. Miss Sarah, ma'am? I asked, sweetest honey, what is it? I chose my words with care. Has Madame Lockton said anything about me in your hearing? She tilted her head a bit as she looked at me. I, this morning, matter of fact, said you wasn't allowed to go to that blasted water pump, said I should send one of the other girls, even though the sun's, 
not be up at the at that time of day even though the streets be covered in ice sarah reached for my elbow as we trod upon the slick patch of cobblestones but i like getting out i said i don't mind the chore we reached the stretch where ashes had been thrown into the ice and the going was safer i don't answer to her she said as she released my arm i answered to the king's army i'd re i'd be right pleased if you kept fetching the water it makes my life easier she stepped stopped and put her hands on her back breathing heavily her baby was so big she could have loaded it in a wheelbarrow and pushed it in front of her she caught me studying her and gave a quick smile the babe will come soon she said it'll be a joyous day i said i'll be getting the water but but what could you please not tell madam sarah stretched to one side and went what she don't know won't hurt her it's not like she's up at that hour anyways after the midday meal, I contrived to overturn the pitcher that held the, the tea water, dumping it on the floor. Clumsy dolt, Sarah scolded as I knelt to clean the floor with rags. Don't be looking at me to trudge up there and get more for her highness mightiness, her high mightiness, Sarah Mary said from her chair by the window. She squinted and sewed another stitch. I've got to hem these breeches before the light fades. I'll run up and fetch it, I said. Double time, I promise. Sarah gave me a good hard stare, sensing she did not have the entire picture before her. It's your neck, she finally said. Mind, mind, she don't see you leave. So she's telling her, okay, if you get caught, that's on you. I near ran up to the Golden Hill Tavern, my raw blisters hurting with every step. Captain Morris was idling in the porch, smoking a pipe. He disappeared inside when he saw me. He was waiting in the alley when I reached it. Here, he handed me a loaf of bread. You made me come up here for this. Take it to Dibden, he said, fighting the smile. There's a note baked inside. A note, it contains wondrous news. He looked ready to jump out of his skin. Washington has beaten them. Sir? He clenched his fist and unclenched them. On Christmas night, the general led a surprise attack on Trenton. He beat the Hessians, killed a handful, and took more than 900 prisoners. So if you've ever heard of that on Christmas Eve while the Hessians were um, drunk and celebrating and all that stuff for Christmas. General Washington went across the Delaware River and in Trenton he won that battle. He basically um, won that battle because he caught them by surprise. That is a real part of history. Um, <clears throat> Are you sure? I thought someone told him a falsehood. The British officers I knew were the kind were confident the American army was falling apart. Positively, he said with a grin. But won't that make the British mad, I asked? I truly hope so. I hope the king is so upset he jumps up and down on his crown. This war is not over, not by a long shot. I handed, I handed the bread back. I'll tell them the news, but I cannot pass a note that could land me in jail. He shoved the bread back at me. You are, ser this, you are a serving girl, delivering a tavern loaf to the starving prisoners. You don't know about the note. But why is it necessary? The men need to see my signature to know this is the truth. They have endured so much, Sal. Don't deprive them of this chance to celebrate. I will strengthen their, it will strengthen their spirits. I pulled up the hood of my coke and to hide my face as I approached the prison. The commons was filled with drilling soldiers, much more than usual. Their officers barked, their officers barked commands with urgency. The men marched grim-faced, swords flapping against their legs, rifles bouncing on their shoulders. Perhaps the captain's news was indeed the truth. I hurried behind the building to the right window. I stood on tiptoe and squished a loaf through the bars. Dibden's face appeared in the window. There's a note inside, I whispered. Tear into it carefully. I ran away before he could answer, willing my feet to move faster. I had walked a black south where the enormous roar erupted from the prison prison hundreds of throats cheering hooting and hollering hundreds of hands clapping and feet stomping with joy the noise was such that folks stopped at what they were doing and ran out the doors to stare the news spread from the prison as fast as it had spread from cell to cell the rebels had attacked instead of running the rebels had advanced instead of retreating the rebels had won a battle folks could scarce credit it and that is the end of chapter 39 uh, Isabel is again risking um, getting beaten or sold again for to, but he, she also is still doing this for Curzon. She said, how long would Dibden wait before they took Curzon's blanket 
or his hat. So she handed the bread over and dashed. Um, so that is the end of chapter 39.